Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We've got a phenomenal program planned for you this evening. We're going to be talking to Dr. Fiorella Terenzi. Her work revolves primarily around astrophysics. So sit back, grab a drink, and enjoy this conversation. The Human Experience in Session. My name is Xavier Katana. My guest for this evening is Dr. Fiorella Terenzi. Fiorella Terenzi is an astrophysicist, musician, and author. Fiorella attained her doctorate from in physics from the University of Milan. She developed the idea of using sound technology to convert radio waves from galaxies into audio form that might give us new insights about space and humanity's place in the universe. She's been described as a cross between Carl Sagan and Madonna by Time Magazine. She, her work has seen her appear in a variety of media outlets, including CNN, the Sci-Fi Channel, NPR, History Channel, Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine. The list goes on and on and on. And now she's here with us on The Human Experience. Fiorella, it's a pleasure. Thank you for making the time to be here. Welcome to HXP. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Fiorella, I mean, there's there's so much accreditation to your work and everything you've been doing, but for anyone that might not know who you are, if you could just give us a short introduction about you know who you are and what you do, please. Uh, I am an astrophysicist, a scientist who was moved by an artistic sensibility, also a recording artist and an author. And my interest is uh, to combine uh, creative art, performance art, music uh, with traditional science education. And uh, the goal is uh, to keep on looking up, uh, being inspired uh, and enlightened. Mm, yeah, I love that. Uh, I mean, so where did this start for, for you as far as astronomy and, and education? I mean, I, I think it was, I think I read that it was someone close to your grandmother and your grandmother introduced you to, to the night sky outside of Milan, right? Yes, that's that's correct. I think I was around five or six years old, and during summertime I was with my grandmother outside Milan. She didn't know anything about stars or galaxy or black hole, but she had a beautiful imagination. So during the nighttime we were going for a walk, up to the full moon, to some star, some constellation that she didn't know. But with her imagination, she was able to transport me. She'd make me feel at the center of the universe. She created a fable and stories about the stars that I still carry with me these days. Hmm. Okay, that sounds amazing. I mean, what was, what was one of the stories that she told you about the stars? A couple of things was um, about, uh, a couple of things I will always remember was uh, the stellar beat uh, of this uh, stellar heart pulsating with mine. After 20 years, when I became a, a student and I was doing my do doctorate, I kept calling the pulsars, mm -hmm. these uh, pulsating stars, the stellar heart of the cosmos, mm -hmm. because I still remember that feeling of looking up. And, uh, and it, it did happen. I did feel, I did felt this heartbeat beating with mine. Hmm. I felt uh, these uh, eyes of the universe, of other stars and galaxies looking at me. I felt uh, empowered uh, and I felt uh, humble. 
because it was a really a big space out there. Yeah, of course. I mean, the universe is such a huge, huge place. So, you know, astronomy and then radio wave music. I mean, how did you connect these two dots? It seems like two very separate worlds to connect, you know, science and art. So... Uh well, they were a separate world for me too, because I grew up, uh, um, you know, singing in the church. Then I was uh, studying music at the conservatorio in Milano during the popular courses in the evening. So during the day, think about I was in the physics department uh, talking about astronomy, astrophysics, uh, radio astronomy. And in the evening, I was studying music, composition, opera singing. So the concept came together by coincidence. Uh, it was really by taking the opposite, like radio astronomy and music at the same time, that I found a key to translate radio waves into sound. Hmm. Okay, okay. So uh, don't stop there, please. What was the key that you found? <laughs> When you uh, collect radio waves from galaxies uh, using radio telescope, uh, specialized antenna, big satellite dish antenna of several meters in diameter, these radio waves from space, from galaxy, arrive to Earth with uh, an intensity, you know, very loud, very soft, uh, and also with a frequency. Uh, the frequency of uh, radio galactic waves are very, very high. Think about, we are talking about uh, billions of vibration per second. Mm -hmm. Now, think about what is a musical note. When uh, we tune our instrument uh, on the musical note A, it's a 440 hertz vibration. So it's a 440 vibration per second. So a musical note, uh, like a radio waves uh, from space, uh, have both uh, intensity and frequency. Mm -hmm. So basically, I could decode uh, radio waves uh, as a sound and then onto music. Uh, but it was uh, by doing opposite things uh, that uh, really I was able to find uh, something unique and interesting. And that is a lesson from the universe I always uh, keep in mind. Uh, mm -hmm. And I always uh, remind my student, uh, um, as I teach at Florida International University in Miami, mm -hmm. uh, to really express yourself. Uh, uh, don't think that uh, if you want to be a comedian, you cannot uh, be a chemist. Uh, if you want to be a model, an actor, you can also be a geologist. Go for it because a new way, a new journey will be shown to you. You will discover a new path. Hmm, okay, so what you're telling your students is that even though whatever you're passionate in, you, can, you should explore those things even if they're in completely different areas. Yes, I think it's very important because we have been... Uh, trapped in this uh, believing, uh, belief that um, black and white, uh, uh, science uh, is not art, uh, left and right brain. And I always felt that, that this uh, division was a little bit uh, too artificial, at least for me. It was a little bit uh, too limiting. Mm -hmm. And uh, even today, um, every single day of my life, I shatter stereotype uh, of a scientist uh, because I'm not uh, like an Albert Einstein uh, caricature. Uh, I'm not uh, like that. Uh, so as I do it, uh, as I'm able to do it, uh, I hope my student uh, and everybody's listening will do it uh, too. Mm -hmm. Just get on the journey, follow what you like, uh, even if they seem so totally opposite, even martial art and music, you will find something in common because everything will come together in your life at a certain point. Hmm, okay, yeah. So it's not that, you know, it's it's not that old saying of jack of all trades, master of none. It's it's you can truly master, you know, these things as long as you have some sort of connection or or passion or, or link or intuitive link to them. The key of mastering is a perseverance. Trust me, to become an astrophysicist, you need uh, at least 20 or 30 years of uh, solid, uh, concrete uh, 
study in the science and also to be a musician. It takes time in life to find things. So persevere, keep on going, and something will happen. I love that. I mean, it, and, but it's, it's also really just putting the work in, like you said, I mean, it took so many years for you to gain this accreditation of, of being an, an astrophysicist, you know, so you, you have to be willing to do the hard work that comes with, with it. Right. Correct. It is a hard work, uh, especially the science, especially the STEM, the science, the technology, engineering, mathematic field. I mean, it's difficult stuff. That's why we need to change also the way we are teaching. We need to make uh, this amazing science concept uh, entertaining, enthralling. They have to become part of the life of our student and our listener. Uh, because a science is really a beautiful concept uh, but imagine sometimes a physics lesson how boring mm. it could be mm-hmm. how difficult how distant it could be that's why we lose uh, so many young mind yeah i could see that you know i could see how how boring physics could get and that i guess that that's part of what makes you such an amazing teacher i'm just hearing the resonance in your voice so Let's let's talk about acoustic astronomy because I mean, the, could you say that music is the language of nature? Could you say that? I would say vibration is the language of the universe. Absolutely. Vibration. So vibration. So everything is vibrating, and yes. and and you are able to assign a musical note to these vibrations, these calculations. Everything is vibrating, everything flickers in and out. Uh, the reality you see is not a continuous, is made of quantum. Even your atoms uh, in every body are made by quantum. So it's an intriguing um, reality that we are facing. My work in uh, astronomy um, started uh, by doing audiofication or sonification of radio waves from space. Mm. To tell you the truth, at the very beginning, I call it the radio computer music astronomy. Mm-hmm. Because for the first time, I combined computer music with radio astronomy. Then the name was too complex, so I switched to acoustic astronomy. Okay. But it, when I did my research in 1987 at the University of California, San Diego, at the Computer Audio Research Laboratory, I was able to work with um, sound synthesis language, computer music. Wow. was the very beginning. You know, the, the computer for the first time was able to synthesize a violin sound, mm-hmm. which then led to the, the synthesizer mm-hmm. uh, that you have with a major music company today, just to name a few, Roland or Yamaha. Mm-hmm. But for me, that digital oscilloscope, that computer music software was a key to interpret not a violin, not an harp, but the radio waves from mm-hmm. the universe. Mm-hmm. So what I did was a straightforward uh, feeding radio waves at uh, billions of hertz into the gigahertz straight into this uh, software, a uh, sound synthesis language uh, called the C Music, uh, was written in C, was uh, created by Professor Richard Moore at the UCSD. And uh, the sound synthesis language sends out sound of uh, the celestial object. In okay. question. Okay. Okay. H- how how does it do that? Uh, there is a, a gen generation function in sound oscilloscope that create the sound, and then you have the intensity of the celestial waves that give you loud or so- soft intensity on the sound, and then you have the frequency. The frequency was a little bit of a problem because we are again into the billion of hertz. And remember that the human can only hear sound between 20 up to 20,000 hertz. Mm, mm, yeah. 
so to make uh, the story um, straight to the point, uh, there is an algorithm that takes uh, one billion hertz down to 1000 hertz, uh, wow. for instance. So everything basically is a shift down in frequency, very much like uh, in one of the episodes of Star Trek. I don't remember the name, but in this old Star Trek, I saw it on TV, Captain Kirk uh, they were hearing this very, very fast buzz, mm -hmm. and then they were slowing down until they were able to detect the voice and someone talking. Mm -hmm. So very much similar to um, what is the process of acoustic astronomy. That's absolutely fascinating. I was intrigued by this. Okay, so so let's say let's say that we are trying to pick a, a target that we're going to sample or record the radio waves of, and then and then turn into music. I mean, you chose a, a galaxy specifically called I think it's UGC 6697, right? Correct. So how, fa how far is that away? I mean, what are the different things that we need to calculate when we're turning this into music? Uh, the galaxy is uh, at the 180 million light years away, just to answer to your question. Mm -hmm. So the radiation that the are arriving on Earth from this galaxy, UGC 6697, they belong basically to the Jurassic time on Earth. So they left the galaxy um, 180 million light years away ago, um, and it took them at that time to arrive on Earth. So they are extremely ancient, they are extremely old. You, you know, when we look up to the universe, we look to the past. Mm, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I remember. You want me? No, yeah. I remember uh, when I when I got my first telescope years ago, and I remember pointing it at uh, I think it was either Saturn or Jupiter. I think Saturn, and and I remember seeing the rings, and it just it blew me away to to be able to look into this you know this little scope and and see a planetary body that was you know, in our solar system, and then I then years later I got a bigger telescope, as one would do if you're studying the stars, right? And and I remember finding my first galaxy and and acknowledging, just realizing that this light is taking this long to yes, you know, reach the the retina in my in my eyes. Correct. Which for me was was a mind blowing thing to think about. Yeah, it's, it's actually um, a very good example. For my student, I use the example of the sun. The light that arrives at your retina every day is already old. It's already an eight to nine minutes old. What does it mean that if the sun exploded right now, we have time to go for a cup of coffee? You will not know that the sun is gone. You will wow. have to wait those eight to nine minutes. Now, think about when you go to the edge of the universe. Now you're looking farther back at 15, 14 billion years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that's at the edge of the limit, at the limit of the universe is where, you know, we are looking at the source, where was the Big Bang, the origin the farther you go in the universe, the older are these celestial objects. So, so Fiorella, I mean, when you when you're were you going to say something? Sorry. Uh, no, I, I wanted to. Um, uh, you you ask me something about the sound of the galaxy. I, I wanted to um, make sure uh, that um, the procedure is uh, clear. Okay. Because uh, once uh, these radio waves uh, come arrive on Earth, they go to a radio telescope, they go to a computer, they go, they go to a software, there is a the reduction in frequency. What you obtain as an audio output, I call it more sound, uh, or maybe a better name should be noise, uh, random noise, because... Uh, all these radiation are created by random phenomena. They are not well modulated like music. So the music as an interpretation of this random sound from this galaxy came later on. When I took this random sound and I sat to the piano and I heard an intonation, I heard a B flat. Okay. I heard a D minor. 
intonation, I heard some musical notes, which then became the inspiration for the music I composed. Mm. But uh, if you go on my research website, Acoustic Astronomy at the Florida International University, you will uh, hear many, many celestial objects, uh, pulsars, stars, sun, the Big Bang, uh, and um, there is not music there. That f- I mean, uh, for the music that we think music is, uh, they are all random, uh, static uh, sound from the universe. Uh, that's uh, how the universe expresses itself uh, for the moment. Uh, if uh, we will find in the universe something very rhythm, uh, very well modulated, uh, then uh, we have to talk about uh, some intelligent uh, civilization. Uh, Mm, okay. Because uh, except for pulsars, they are like cosmic drummer in the universe. They keep a precise uh, tempo. Except uh, for pulsar, most radiation from the universe, it's really random, uh, noisy, static. Mm, mm-hmm. You know, so that's a great moment. I think I'm just going to play about 10 seconds, not very long at all, just a few seconds of just to give people an idea of what it kind of sounds like, because when I heard it for the first time, it it didn't sound like anything I expected. Okay, so here is, and I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear this or not, Fiorella, but the mm-hmm. the audience will. And this is uh, your track called Neo, N-E-O. Okay, Neo, it's music. Okay. If you want to play for, for our audience uh, raw galactic data, you have to use uh, uh, collision, uh, okay. sidereal breath, plasma waves. Uh, okay, let's go. Those so, are raw. Okay, so we'll go with collision then. Okay. okay collision. Okay, okay, here is collision, and this is what it sounds like. Here, here it goes. Okay, I mean, it's it's really really fascinating. It's it's really unlike. It's very spacey, kind of spooky, you know. And and it it doesn't. You know, it it kind of it kind of puts me on edge a little bit, right? It does. It does. It's uh, they are a powerful sound. They are able to evoke. They provoke even reaction. Um, sometimes the galaxy get a little bit more quiet. So you can uh, maybe meditate and relax, uh, but otherwise, a lot of celestial objects are pretty, pretty energetic. I would say. Hmm. You know, Fiorella, I'm, I'm really curious. It, have, have when you're looking up, you know, up there, it, have you found anything that you know seemed unusual, alien life, you know, objects that you thought just don't make sense? I mean, is there any connection to that? I mean. It, there's there's a lot of conspiracy theories about you know aliens stuff like that ever encounter anything like that before um i haven't encountered any alien too bad though i'm <laughs> looking i'm looking for i mean, I mean the universe why- is so big why i mean why does it seem so empty uh, uh, it uh, probably it's uh, from our point of view it's a limitation in our technology too um, the Kepler um, telescope uh, uh, is only capturing a very narrow uh, sample of planet of nearby planet in the Milky Way galaxy nearby where we are it's not the capturing 100% of the Milky Way it's capturing like probably even less than uh, 1% so it's a narrow it's still a very, very, very narrow uh, database that we have. Uh, mm. um, I don't remember how many, but you know, this uh, ex- exoplanet, uh, this uh, planet uh, around uh, other star, they are still in the few hundreds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if we are up to a thousand. So it's a small sample. We have a limited technology. Um, plus, there is uh, the time problem. Right. The time problem. Uh, if another civilization is across the Milky Way galaxy, it will take 100,000 years uh, yeah. for us to receive a low. We are here. Right. That, I mean, that's a major issue, right? Because it takes light so much time to travel such vast distance. That's right. How are we going to know if it's there right, you know, right now? 
that that's so going back to your question that what is unusual unusual for me uh, to see a universe uh, that seems to be designed for uh, zero communication it feels like we are an isolated experiment to me but this is you know using you know, my imagination, sometimes uh, I think about uh, this uh, impossibility to talk to another civilization because of the speed of light limit. Oh, man, wow. I mean, that, it boggles my mind because, you know, I really want us to encounter, you know, alien life at some point. It just seems like a natural pro- progression in, in the human, you know, evolution of, of things. And it, it seems like the planet here is in, in big trouble. And, we need to eventually, you know, venture out into space you know, to have a backup plan, you know, to save our species. I, and we will, we will. Um, but you know, don't be discouraged because uh, um, probably Mars, uh, I hope so, will reveal life, uh, not intelligent life, uh, not technologically advanced life, uh, but you know, single cell a microorganism. Uh, um, you will not find an elephant or a giraffe look-alike on Mars, uh, mm. but uh, you will find life uh, I, I, in Europe. Uh, also, very, very, very high probability for life. Uh, Titan. Uh, so we may find life uh, in the solar system. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you think that our definition of what is sentient, what we define is as life could be so far from sort of our ability to conceive or think about, you know, what's what's out there, what's really out there that, you know, we're not, we're just not seeing it. You know, maybe it's a pure energy instead of, I mean, there's no matter involved, but it's sentient and it's, it's alive. It's a great question, and uh, yes, I think you're right. Uh, there is uh, also that possibility that life is uh, something totally far away from what we know it. And look at what is happening to us, humankind. We are transferring everything on the web. So in the future, in the near future, I will be an avatar, you will be living in the internet forever. If something happened to planet Earth, we are going to live forever in eternity if we can keep alive our computer, right? Or our network. Are you following me? I'm following. So imagine an alien form that arrive, how, how they're going to think about the World Wide Web, as a storage for us, a humankind experience, uh, able to communicate, because probably we will become uh, uh, intelligent avatar. We will become intelligent uh, digital form, uh, able even to taste the chocolate and ice cream. Mm, mm. So, uh, I- indeed, probably even some intelligent life form may have, uh, may have evolved into something uh, that we can't even imagine. Hmm. Let me add something, though, okay. yeah. uh, that uh, I like to talk about alien, uh, and I explained uh, on my uh, interview on Ancient Alien on the History Channel uh, that uh, probably we are alien. Yeah. Look yourself in the mirror yeah. and we are the I agree. We right we where do we come from? Another star. How do we got here? As amino acid aboard of a comet. Hmm. We were just a plain amino acid frozen in this comet collision with planet Earth and here we are doing the interview tonight. <laughs> it's quite a jump, right? But I it's mean quite- I mean, you've, I'm surely you know what, you know, cross species contamination, like let's say you take a lizard from South America and you transport it illegally over to Africa and you drop it, you know, because of its natural adv- advantages, you know, to other species, it's going to decimate, you know, the, the ecology of, yeah. of Africa, right? So yes. if, if, oh, you yeah. look, if you look at the way humans are in their natural equilibrium to ecology there is none you know that we decimate everywhere we go we just sort of consume it and you know and then if you if you look at like a hard winter I mean you're not you're not equipped Mm -hmm. to handle a hard winter so yeah Yeah. I, I agree with you I agree that you know we we are the aliens yeah we are the invasive species absolutely yes yes 
Yeah. So go on. So please. alien exist. I exist. We exist. <laughs> <laughs> we are the aliens, probably. I do believe so. Uh, and um, sometimes I wish I could have uh, that memory. I, I wish my atoms in my body could have the memories uh, or when we were near that star. Wouldn't be that mm, great mm, uh, mm. to remember all the star we have been through because our sun is not here for long. And inside of our sun, before there were many more stars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So before our sun was born, there were a big super giant star that detonated and uh, recycled into the sun as we know it today. But, you know, of course, the atoms, they don't keep uh, memories. Uh, hmm. So we can get there with our imagination and fantasy, however. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's fun to do that, right? It makes it really in entertaining and exciting, right? I mean, what about what about our own solar system? I mean, if... If the moon is, you know, if we if we went to the moon, I'm still not sure about this. Like, if we went there, why isn't there a base there? Why haven't we colonized the moon? I mean, we should have done this already, right? I, I think so. We should have uh, even, you know, have baby in space, uh, see how in zero gravity we are evolving. Um, I, I'm not sure what happened to the moon. I know there are a lot of experts to that. Uh, it will happen. There are some plan to, uh, at least Elon Musk, I'm sure, is thinking about that, sure. right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, but, how would you get past the, the Val Van Allen radiation belt? I mean, isn't that, it's almost like a quarantine type system. There's so much radiation bouncing off, what is it, the magnetosphere, right? The magnetosphere. But, you know, we went to pass through that. So we, we have the key to pass through that. And a, a colony on the moon will be the next logic step, at least from my point of view. Uh, also because uh, I'm entering middle age, so to be in a less gravity environment <laughs> would be beneficial to my knees <laughs> and spine. <laughs> That's really I would funny. Be much younger on the moon. But I right? mean, yeah, I mean, it makes it just makes perfect sense to use the moon as a jump off point to anywhere else we go. All of our resources, I mean, all of the resources we could ever need or want are in outer space. That's where they are. So why we're still here, I mean, if we've actually been there and I, you know, you said there's a key to getting through the, the Van Allen radiation belt. What is it? You know, what is the key? I mean, just shielding that radiation somehow? <laughs> It is a shielding, absolutely, yes. Uh, remember, we have a spacecraft in orbit around the Jupiter, which has a much, uh, much more powerful radiation zone around, that has a much more powerful magnetosphere than planet Earth. Mm. So we can go through that. We can go shielding. Mm. We have a shield. We have the technology. We have a new, new type of material. I don't see that being a problem. Do you know... I, I apologize. Please finish. The problem is probably resources. Uh, uh, I think the next step may be an international effort, like the International Space Station has been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Fiorella, I'm, I'm curious if you know, you know, do you know who Nikola Tesla is? Surely you know mm -hmm. who that is. So, you know, sure. what happened there in, in our own history? I mean, it was maybe 100 years ago, a little bit more than 100 years ago, I mean, he was presenting a technology that could have pulled, you know, what was he doing exactly? He was pulling energy from, you know, this etheric space or something like that? Uh, you know, I'm not super familiar in detail with the Tesla, but yes, his focus was on electricity and the transfer of energy. Wireless. And uh, correct, without any... Uh, uh, material, uh, correct, uh, through the ether, through the um, empty space, uh, or through air. So it was a pretty advanced. Uh, uh, we never got there. Mm, all got interrupted uh, um, and got stopped. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, But I'm not sure about the mechanism, uh, um, why, okay. what happened in his life. So, I mean... Wouldn't things be interesting if we were using a technology that didn't rely right now on fossil fuels? I mean, we supposedly hit peak oil, I think, in the 90s. I mean, they were talking about that in the 90s that we had reached, you know, the peak period of, of all of the oil on the planet. So, 
you know, t- it seems like time is running out. I mean, right now in the news, um, the Amazon is burning. I'm not sure if you've heard about this yet. Yes. I mean, it's, it's tragic. Yeah. So it seems like humans, you know, like the earth will survive climate change. Humans, you know, maybe 0.009% of us or something will survive, you know, not yeah. many. Yeah. Well, what what we are seeing these days is uh, what the physics uh, teaches us, uh, uh, that uh, there is no system that can keep on growing and growing and growing. In other words, uh, there is um, no planet that continuously can generate tons and tons and food for of food, tons and tons of uh, fossil fuel. Is impossible. The type of growth to infinity, infinity is impossible. So you are seeing a system. Our planet is starting to manage and breaking down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so I mean, what are what are the solutions? I mean, it just seems like you know, if if population continues to increase the way it is, and you know, we're consuming the resources that we're consuming at the at the current rate, and that is supposed to double by twenty fifty. So, I mean, it seems like we're just taking more and more from the planet and not putting anything back. I mean, who, I mean, Elon Musk seems to be very motivated on creating uh, fossil free energy, you know, this. So, how do we come up with a solution for this you know, mega problem? It is, it is the biggest problem that we're currently facing. You're right. I I don't have a great answer. I'm thinking about, uh, um, you know, electricity. I'm thinking about the nuclear. I'm thinking about the solar energy. Most likely nuclear Hmm. uh, has to be handled with care, though. Hmm. I mean, yeah, because nuclear energy is is dirty energy, right? I mean, there's there's waste that comes from it. There's there's all kinds of danger if if you're not, if there's a if there's a rupture or a leak, yeah. you've got massive problems. Yeah, it has to be handled with care. But it could be. I mean, uh, I wish uh, we could have uh, the power of our sun that is doing hydrogen fusion uh, uh, every single day. And I wish we could uh, fuse, uh, do that hydrogen fusion, but we can't. Uh, we cannot do it because we cannot achieve uh, the temperature of the sun. Um, that would be a, that could be a solution. Maybe we are going to harvest the sun as for energy, and once we deplete the sun, we are going to go into Alpha Centauri, the next near star. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm just uh, thinking out loud uh, right now. I mean, so so if you know if these other beings exist, let's say aliens exist and they're aware of us, you know, would they regard us? I mean, because we're still at war with each other. I mean, we're, we still have people who are homeless. We're still dealing with poverty. We, we still, you know, fight over religion, politics. I mean, we're, we don't seem really that advanced. I mean, if, I mean, I, you know, I've always think, I always think about if aliens, you know, if, if you're an alien being and you're, you're floating around space and you think, hey, let's go on vacation, there's no alien that's saying, hey, let's go on vacation on Earth. Like there's no alien that's saying that, you know, you don't think that ever because it it seems so turbulent, you know, it seems like we have a lot of problems. So, you know, do you think other beings could regard us as primitive or just too primitive to contact? Probably, probably I would say so. I'm still amazed that we still use uh, propulsion uh, as a way to move around uh, and that is a pretty primitive uh, um, I'm still, um, uh, at the same time, I do believe in the humankind. I do believe in this potential. Uh, I, I do believe, like you say, in the human experience. Uh, um, I, I do believe that there is a great side of our mind. Okay. And we need to tap into that, has, have more faith, maybe be less negative, uh, help each other, stay together. Uh, because uh, think about in one way our consciousness uh, um, got better even with the use of smartphone. Uh, now we are more social. Now we can have our own radio show. Now we can voice what we think much better. Now we can tweet uh, right away uh, an opinion. So I think we are coming together. 
I think uh, there is a there is a something that is a pulling humanity together, and uh, with this uh, togetherness, uh, we will be able to probably solve uh, uh, and get a better environment, uh, a better society for the future. I, I do. I have a great faith, a human being, to tell you the truth. Uh, hmm. okay. I mean, I think you nailed it. I, th- I think you said. It. I think you know it would require us to unite in some way to collectively address this problem. And, and I think even Ronald Reagan had a, had a speech, uh, I think it was in the eighties. And he said, you know, we need a common threat and an external threat, like an alien threat. It was very ominous, ominous speech that he gave. But I mean, it's true. I mean, if, if we, if we have a common problem that maybe unites us like the planet dying, where we we have no choice, Mm -hmm. but to, but, but it seems like, you know, people, People wait until it, you know, it's directly affecting them. You know, I, I I'm not near the Amazon, so you know, mm-hmm. it doesn't. It's not, I don't feel the smoke. I don't smell it. You know, so it, it's it doesn't bother it, me. It's true. At the same time, even you know, the water pro- problem, we are more aware. At the same time, we have more information today. So we, I mean, all humanity on this planet is aware that, you know, saturated fat are not good. So it really, then it comes down to your decision or what you put in your mouth because the information is there. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, I, I do believe we, we, we are getting better. We are not perfect, but we are on the way to find a good way to collaborate. Also because there is no other choices, to tell you the truth. Otherwise, you know, an asteroid will arrive on Earth, and boom, like, like the dinosaur. Hmm. I mean, <laughs> will kill us. Yeah, I mean, th- that seems like it would just, that, that's the direction, you know, like, if, if we don't figure something out eventually, I mean, I, I think I read that it, in the news a couple of weeks ago, there was, there was an asteroid that, that went just by Earth and, um, you know, it was pretty large, large enough, but it, it just missed us or something like just, that. Yeah. Yeah, quite a lot, quite constantly. Hmm. Now we see more of them because we have more technology. So we can pinpoint them. In the past, there was more or less the same percentage of asteroid, but now we can see them, we can trace, and hopefully we are going to be able to deflect them if they are on a collision course with this planet. Mm-hmm. So that's the power of technology. And the look how fast this technology is going. It's really going exponentially. Sure, yeah. It has. It's accelerating and expanding like our universe. So sometimes, you know, there is a, such a big parallel between the universe and everyday life. A technology in acceleration like our universe, accelerating in expansion. Hmm. Was there anything that you saw in space that sort of mystified you? Something you know, maybe a little bit bizarre or strange that just puzzled you a little bit? Actually, there is, a, you know, quite a lot. But the most important uh, is uh, the most important that I think about it daily is how the universe maximizes good coincidences. Hmm. Okay. The, there is a high probability for two atoms in the universe to come together and collide. So even if a most space is empty, these two atoms will find a way to collide and they create a star and then planets. And here we are again tonight. So there is an optimization of good coincidence happening. I mean, look at even tonight that we are talking. How did it happen? Right. Yeah. What was the coincidence that brought us tonight in this dialogue? So you're, are you saying that it's like a sort of cosmic butterfly effect that you're, that you're talking about? Like, you know, one... Somewhat. One, something like that, right? S- something is a, a maximization of good coincidence. So things happen. Huh. I mean, if you could, you know, go on, explain a little bit further, you know, what you mean. You know, okay, I understand two atoms, mostly in empty space. It's probably unlikely that two atoms are going to collide. You know, it's not, not the usual thing. So what other things you, did you notice, other coincidences? Well, th- think about your mom, how many eggs had in her ovaries? Hundreds. 
hundreds and hundreds of eggs. Yet it took one, one good coincidence of one good spermatozoa, and there you are, and you were born. So even in conception is a maximization of coincidence. Hmm. That's the first time I've thought about my mom's ovaries. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, okay, so, I, you know, I get your point. There's, there is a, you know, there is a, a beauty, you know, there is a, there's something graceful about the way the universe operates. And, I mean, I have to ask, I know you're a hardcore scientist. Do, do you believe in God? Um, I actually, I actually do not in the God with the beard, but I do believe in some organizing power. Okay, so we could call it like source, or, you know, something like that. Like a source, yes. Uh, it, 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 there is a, some, um, there is a something that escape my reasoning. It, it escape my neuron about this universe, and this is something. This organizing power, this a source, can't be reached by thoughts. Can it, it has to be reached some other way. In baby art, uh, you need to go past this reality. And that where I think this uh, organizing power, uh, how this is, uh, universe is structured, uh, even the law of physics, uh, this uh, principle I see every single day in my telescope uh, mm -hmm. are the same principle that act on my life every single day. And what's funny is that it is a principle I see in the universe that cannot be broken. They work everywhere. And when you try to break them, you only break yourself. Because gravity is a law. Cannot be broken. Okay. Okay. So let, let's, get, let's, let's step back a little bit to what you said about, you know, reaching this point of source. Uh, you said... You said that we have to reach it by going beyond reality. Is that what you said? Yeah, I, I, beyond, beyond our thought. I think this, um, this organizing power, uh, this uh, power that uh, from uh, being this energy that uh, from being pure energy become matter. This uh, source uh, that uh, is uh, unmanifested and then become manifested. Uh, cannot be known by our thought. I believe uh, it, it can't be known by scientific data and measurement. I think it lies in a different dimension that is not the brain dimension, the brain, the analytical brain, the computational brain, the data. I think it, it I don't know how to access it at all. We don't know how to access. Man, I'm loving it's this like, interview. <laughs> it's beyond that dimension. I, it could be via art. You don't know. Maybe some artist. I saw some painters. They were painting galaxies without even knowing it. Uh, uh, some musician uh, probably were even uh, composing the sound of space uh, uh, you just played for our listener. Mm -hmm. There is a, a dimension that uh, we are not able to tap into. Or if we tap, we go in and out. So we cannot grab it. That's why um, I just have to believe that there is an organizing power. But according to what I see, I think there is. So I do believe in God. It's, it's fascinating. You know, I've had a lot of scientists on the show and... Fiorella, I mean, this is this is fascinating. I'm loving this conversation. I really find your your openness to these concepts, you know, really engaging. It, it's really refreshing to hear, you know, someone that is that has you know done the work and put the the math into all of this to you know sort of entertain these theories at least, you know, and give give them a chance. Well, let me run by to you a couple of ideas then. Okay, please. Uh, because I'm collecting them for, for a book, uh, I'd love to hear what you think. Okay. Uh, so, do you feel like you're always transforming and evolving like the universe? Yes. So, there you have it. So, you have the same quality. Uh, do you think that uh, um, you 
as a human being can only be known by thoughts mm. or to get to know you I need also to feel your heart, uh, the energy you emanate. Uh. Yeah, I mean it's it's yeah it's the energy and 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 being physically around me to get to know me truly. It couldn't be just by thought. I would have to be some physical, a physical interaction. Some physical. So you see, that's the same. That's what I was telling you about the universe. The universe can't be known only by thoughts. <laughs> it's a transcendental to thoughts. That dimension uh, that I'm talking about, uh, we have to find a key to get into there. Okay, okay. So, you know, just I'm just openly thinking about this and, and wondering what you think as well. And what about psychedelics? You know, when we've talked to uh, researchers, scientists, eth ethnopharmacologists who you know, study the DMT molecule, and there seems to be some sort of relationship into entering this you know, altered dimension this alternate reality i mean do you think do you think it could be through psychedelics uh, well according to dr timothy leary which uh, uh, as you know i worked with uh, dr leary uh, he started the research at harvard universe on the effect of lsd mm -hmm. and it's a property uh, you know even to cure depression i'm not uh, an expert into that uh, but um, i would say that uh, Perhaps uh, for scientific research, uh, it could help us. It could help a scientist uh, uh, to form a new idea, mm -hmm. maybe to review her theory. Um, I'm just, you know, thinking out loud. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be a way. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, even Albert Crick, I think it was recorded that he was microdosing when he visualized the double helix, you know, DNA. Right. So. It, Correct. Go ahead. I would say I'm not a per se pro drugs. Okay. Probably I would prefer to encourage you to use maybe meditation. Okay. I had maybe, a feeling. Yeah, meditation uh, to access a different reality. Probably constant meditation uh, because um, you read about uh, certain meditation, certain mantra. A certain way you speak, uh, uh, certain words that have a really amazing power. And uh, probably I would encourage more meditation, uh, mantras, some Zen theories, uh, uh, to look into that. Uh, and that's uh, personally what I do. My meditation is uh, to look up to this uh, infinite universe uh, every single time I can. Uh, even if I have a city light of Miami, that's my meditation. Yeah. Uh, even through music, I'm able to unlock uh, a door on this uh, scientific universe uh, uh, that um, perhaps uh, just via analytical mind and an analytical brain, I would not be able to. Mm -hmm. I find also myself using my body uh, as, a, as a key to enter that uh, reality. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, like through body, yoga. Yeah, yoga, ecstasy also. Um, uh, it, it access a different dimension uh, through which then I can review some scientific finding, studies, uh, theory. So we have a lot of tools. We just, we are not used to think of them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I mean, we, we think that the chemically induced we can do better, but I actually believe we have it all within ourselves. Sure. Because I see that in the universe. The universe has everything in itself. Okay, so, so let's, I mean, let's, let's focus on meditation then, you know, and, and let's talk about um, types of meditation that, uh, a person could use and the different states that that a person can enter I mean I've studied meditation for a very long time and um, how have you heard of out-of-body experiences through meditation yes I do is there any scientific yes, correlation do. between the out-of-body experience and you know how is that possible that I'm perceiving something external that you know like how am I how is that a pot how can that be happening how I I'm just uh, um, thinking out loud to your question. <laughs> this out of body experience uh, are um, 
induced state uh, uh, you get to that state uh, uh, by some uh, you know meditation technique or hypnosis uh, in that state uh, you can access uh, very precious information i believe that uh, then uh, you need to keep that information and use your analytical power okay. to interpret those data. In my case, as a physicist, I need to access this altered state, this out-of-body experience, this hypnosis. And first I have to remember what I saw, and then I have to interpret what I saw using analytical mind. It means I have to prove it and then disprove it, and then prove it again. So I'm, I'm telling you this one because I don't want you to, um, I don't want you to, to, to hear that what I'm saying is that through um, altered state or out-of-body ex, um, out mm -hmm. um, experience, yeah. we are going to find the answer for the universe. Because even if you have it, then you have to prove it scientifically. Right. That's the scientific methodology. Right. So the, that, the, the, the results have to be reproducible. Correct. Unless you want to be an artist, unless you want to compose music, you want to create a screenplay, then you have an unlimited way to interpret that. As a scientist, I need to grab that dimension that I saw and put it into some form that every scientist across the planet can repeat the experiment to confirm it. So it's complex, it's not that simple. The scientific methodology is uh, um, it's very important because it's across all denominator, across all planet. And I'm a scientist, so I needed to build a new science. Hmm. It's it's really fascinating the work you're doing and the the openness like I said is is really remarkable. Um, you know, you get into virtual reality. I think we should cover that before we close here in a few minutes. I mean, it, it, it's, VR is something that you're pretty big into. I mean, um, you mentioned living inside of computers before, but virtual reality and and senses uh, this this theme of interacting and and viewing things in in new ways. So. You know how can yeah. how can VR systems you know, incorporate these these senses and and kind of allow our consciousness to exist inside of you know a computer? Well, uh, the planetarium I would like to build at Florida International University. It, it will be like uh, um, a real planetarium, but the the user will you be in a virtual reality, so they will see all the solar system, this planet in a, in three D, in this uh, virtual reality environment that will allow my student uh, or the user to interact with it. Uh, within the planetarium, you will also smell the planet. Uh, Mars will smell like a gunpowder. You will also be able to taste the planet. Yes, mm. you will be able to taste a little bit of ammonia from Jupiter and Saturn where you, when you are going to approach the, the planet. So this is a five-sense virtual environment planetarium, which I believe is the new way of teaching. Is a virtual reality where the student is fully immersed. And I do believe also that through this type of technology, we will access a new knowledge. I also believe that we are on the verge to discover new physics, new law of physics. Our physics book, I believe, will be written pretty, pretty soon because a new discovery are being made. Uh, but technology, virtual reality, even bionic, we will be bionic. I will not need to Google anymore, thank goodness. Google will be in the back of my brain, attached to my brain. The microphone will be not uh, hanging from my ear, will be straight into my tooth. I can't wait to be bionic. Mm -hmm. Instant recall of a database. I mean, I'm I'm double si I'm double minded about this. You know, I'm not sure how ready I am okay. to transfer my consciousness into a, a machine and live forever. It sounds like a horrifying thing. I mean, I, 
you know, I just, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know how comfortable I feel with that right now. And, and I'm not sure how much I want, you know, a microchip in the back of my head and, you know, pulling up information, random information all the time. You know, I just, mm-hmm. so I don't know. There's a resistance to that a little bit, you know, from, from my side of things, but I, I can see how, you know, this is the future. We are moving into this realm of transhumanism where people are ready to, you know, j- jump and leap into this this realm of virtual reality existing through virtual reality and i mean even today already today people are already in that state it's just you know it's just slower because we have these devices in our hands you know if we could mm-hmm. yes. wear a device that was ver- wearable or you know that we could turn on that was that was already implanted and we could be in that state we would be in that state all the time you know mm-hmm. because people don't even look up from their phones when when you pass them on the street mm-hmm. so you know it's we're already there uh, well, you are seeing the 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 bad of this uh, mobile looking down and social media and all of that. It actually, I think, is going to turn around. It's going to be give us a lot of freedom. We will have uh, more friends. But uh, what I was saying was uh, the use of technology for betterment, uh, betterment of um, the human condition. Because I'm tired to wear glasses. Mm-hmm. So if someone is going to offer me a new retina. A, a new lens, and I don't have to go through cataract. I would take that. Mm-hmm. You follow me? If I can see better, hear better, I would like that. But of course, you know, there is an attachment for myself too. Don't get me wrong to who I am. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dilemma a little bit right now. But I, I, I think technology could be a good key for us, a human being, for the future. I mean, it is the future. I mean, whether I like it or not, we're going we're going in that direction. It's happening either way, right? It's true. It's happening either way. Correct. Uh, Dr. And Terenzi, it's happening in acceleration. In acceleration. It seems like it's getting faster and faster and faster as faster we as faster. we go along, right? So, yes. I mean, Dr. Terenzi, is there, we covered a lot of different things in this show. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you want to talk about or mention? No, just, you know, keep on looking up. Uh, uh, believe in yourself. Uh, you have it all within. Uh, you are li- really a universe within. Uh, so go forth for your dream. Uh, don't give up. Uh, perseverance. Uh, and again, just keep looking up. Such a great, such a great interview, Dr. Transy. Where can people find your work? Where can they go to your website? I, I know there's uh, Heavenly Knowledge, a book that came out a while ago. Any plans to write a new book, maybe? Yes, I would like to write uh, the principle we discussed today, a book about the life lesson of the universe. And I would like also to release a, a new music uh, um, compilation of new songs uh, on Spotify. So a lot of things happening, including a virtual reality app for my student, a virtual book. Quite a lot of uh, great things happening. And, wh- and where can people go? Yeah, you know, maybe a Google uh, Fiorella Terenzi. Also, there is uh, my website and Wikipedia. Check me out at Florida International University. I'm pre- pretty reachable on the internet. Uh, okay. Pretty easy to find okay. me. Okay, very good. We'll make that link available. Uh, Fiorella, just hang tight for me. Let me just do this close, and and we're gonna talk for. I want to talk to you just for a second. Hang tight. Guys, what an amazing interview. Man, that that one had me thinking a lot, you know? And hopefully it did the same for you. Uh, had, had you thinking and about some of the questions that we asked on the show and, you know, thinking about them in new ways. So that's what it did for me. But um, that's, that's going to do it for us here at HXP for this week. Um, certainly we'll, we will be back with another live broadcast for you next week. If you're listening to this on the YouTube version, click subscribe, click the notify bell. If you're listening to this in the podcast version, you can find us on YouTube and sc- subscribe as well. Um, what would be great if you guys could do right now, if you're, if you've made it to the end of the show is get over to iTunes, leave us a review. We are currently ranked in the top 100 or so podcasts subscribe on itunes leave us a review if you like the show if you don't like the show um that's 
pretty much it, guys. I, you know, one of the things that I hear the most is that people haven't heard about our show, even though we've interviewed so many people. So if you could just recommend the show to your friends and family and the people that you care about, that would be amazing. But that's going to do it for us here tonight, folks. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great night.